Hey, it's Lucky. Welcome to the first part of this three-part Ultimate FPS Controller tutorial series. We're going to start off by setting up a basic FPS controller with crouching, jumping, sprinting, all the basic stuff. In the next couple of tutorials, we'll go more and more in depth on building this amazing controller. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so let's get into the basic FPS controller. Uh, I'm going to supply this assets folder. In here we have some basic textures and HDRI to set up the scene. Uh, the textures are the grids from Kenny. I'll leave a link to his website and the textures below. But you can also just download the folder from the GitHub of this tutorial. There's also an HDRI of HDRI Haven. It's just a pretty sky to have something to look at instead of the default uh, Godot sky. So once you have your assets folder, it's time to start up Godot. I'm using version 4.1.1. You can use any version you want. There's nothing specific for 4 or 4.1, but this is just the latest release right now. So I'm going to create a new project. I'm going to drop it in my Godot projects folder. I'm going to name it first person controller. I'm going to click create folder to create its own folder and click create and edit. Let that load up. And the first thing we're going to do is drop in our assets folder. So you can just drag and drop your assets folder into the res. And now that everything's imported, let's set up some basic inputs. Uh, for this, you can go to project, project settings on the top left, going to input map and start naming your inputs. So for a first person controller, we're going to need a forward button, backward button for moving backwards left button, right button, and in this tutorial we're also going to set up sprinting, so we're going to do a sprint button, and crouching, so we're going to do a crouch button. Next we'll set up the key codes for these commands, so for forward we're going to use W, for backwards we're going to use A, or sorry S, for left we're going to use A, for right we're going to use D, and for sprinting we're going to use shift, and for crouching, we're going to use control. So now this is all set up, we can close this out. Next up, I'd like to do some file organization. So in my file browser, I'm going to create two new folders. The first one is going to be scripts. And the second one is going to be scenes. So of course, in the scripts folder, we're going to put all our scripts. And in the scenes folder, we're going to put all our scenes. And speaking about scenes, let's set up our main scene. So on the top left, we'll click new 3D scene. And we'll call this scene, or we'll call this node by double clicking the node, world. Uh, in this world, we're going to have a couple of things. So let's also separate those out by right clicking the world node, add child node, and creating another node 3D. You can just search for node and click node 3D. And this one is going to be our stage. The second thing we're going to add to the world is a container node for the environment and the lighting. So I'm just going to add another node 3D, call it env. Oh, env. And in here I'm going to drop my uh, sunlight and my environment, which will take care of the skybox and post-processing effects. To easily add these to your scene, you can click the three dots up top here and click add sun to scene and click add environment to scene. And you could just leave them right here in the root of the scene, but I'd like to put them in their own little nodes so everything stays clean. And speaking about world environment, let's add that HDRI that we uh, put in the assets folder. So you can click on the world environment on the top left, and then on the top right, click on the environment, and in here you have a tab named sky. Drop this down and click sky again. Oh, not the drop down, just this one. In here you can see sky material. Right now it's using a procedural sky material that comes with Godot. But we're going to use our own HDRI. So you can click on this one uh, and click the little refresh icon to clear it out. So you can see the sky disappeared. Click empty and click new panoramic sky material. This one will say empty. You can just click on it and click quick load to find our own HDRI. You can see it's the first one on the top dot hdri click open this loading always takes a little while sometimes it even crashes 
as you can see right here it's doing a little weird stuff but finally it works now we got this beautiful sky in our scene but of course we also need a floor so this is what we're going to add next go into your stage node right click it add child node and search for box we're going to use this csg box 3d click create and we're using this CSG box here instead of just a normal mesh because it has easy collisions. So easy in fact you just have to tick this little box here on the right, use collisions and now the player and other objects can collide with this box. Now right now this box is one meter by one meter which is a bit small for a floor. So let's change the size. Here on the top right we can set it. I'm gonna set the X to 20. The Y can stay one because this is the height and the Z also 20. Now we have a nice big floor to work with. Then I'm going to scroll down in the CSG box to transform and I'm going to move it down a little bit. So it's on the world origin. You can see right here the lines of the world origin are going to the middle of the box. We would like the box to be a little bit lower so we can still see the world origin. I'm going to do this by setting the Y to minus 0 0.5 again in transform in the SG CSG box. And now you can see it's nice and aligned with the world origin. Now let's put in that beautiful grid texture that we got from Kenny. You can do this by scrolling up in the box again. And here in material, we're going to create a new material for this floor. So click on empty, new standard material. Click the material to open it up. And there's a lot of properties in here, but we're only going to care about albedo and UV1. In albedo, there's a tab named texture and in here we're going to set our grid texture so click on empty quick load just like we did with the hdri and find that dark texture dark texture 7. open it up and now you can see we have this giant grid which we don't want we want it to be small and represent one meter by one meter this is easily done by scrolling down to uv1 the tab we opened up earlier and enabling triplanar now you can see a beautiful one by one grid on this 20 by 20 floor. And that's the stage all set up. Now let's get into the player. But before we do that, we're gonna save this scene. So hit Ctrl S on your keyboard, go into your scenes folder, and we're gonna call this main. Now let's add our player. So we'll close out the stage node in the world and create a new child node for the world. And this one is gonna be a character body because our player is gonna be a character body 3D. Just search for character and double click character body 3D. Now you can see the character body is giving us a little warning sign. And it's because a character body always needs a collision shape. This is the shape used to collide with the floors and the walls and everything around it. So we're going to add this. Right click the character body in the world node. Click add child node. And search for a collision shape. We're going to use collision shape 3D. Create. Then Right here on the top right, we're going to set a shape for this collision shape 3D. So click on empty and we're going to use a capsule. Now you can see the player is stuck halfway in the floor. This is not what we want. So you can hold down control on your keyboard, grab the little green arrow, this is for the Y axis, and drag it up by one meter. This will align the character perfectly with the floor. So now we got a basic player shape. Let's add a little camera to him. But we can just add a camera straight into the collision shape. We're going to need a pivot. This is so we can move the head independently of the player body. And so for this, we're going to go back into character body 3D, right click it, add child node, and search for node, and add a node 3D. This is going to be our head. So in a transform, we can set the height of our head. Your player can be any height you want, but I'm going to make mine 1.8 meters. And then finally, in this node, we're going to add a child node, Again, by right-clicking the node, adding a child node, and searching for camera 3D. And that's what we're going to view from. That's our head. Now, let's rename these nodes so everything makes a little more sense. The character body 3D, it can be player. You can rename the nodes by double-clicking them. The node 3D, that's going to be our head, is going to be named head. The rest we'll leave as is for now. Now, in order to control the player, move it around and look around, we're going to need to add a script to it. This is easily done by clicking the player node. Make sure you're selecting the character body 3D and not one of its child's nodes. And clicking the 
script button, attaching a new script. For the path, right now you can see it wants, it wants to save it into scenes, but we want it into the scripts folder. So click the little folder icon next to the, next to the path, click the little up arrow and go into the scripts folder. And we're gonna name it player. You can also see it selected a basic template for this script because we're attaching it to a character body 3D. We're actually gonna use this template. So you can just leave it as is and click create. And here you can see Godot already generated some code for us. Let's see what this code does. In the beginning of the code, you can see it sets a speed variable and a jump velocity variable. Next, it gets the gravity uh, from the project settings. After this, it goes into the physics process function. This is a function that is run for every physics tick. First off, it's checking if the player is not on the floor. Then it's gonna add gravity to it. So if you're in the air, it's gonna push the player down to the ground. Next up, it's gonna check if we're pressing a jump button and if it's on the floor. And if so, we're gonna jump by adding our jump velocity to our Y velocity. And lastly, it's gonna take an input direction and this is going to take it from right now UI left, UI right, UI up and UI down, which are the arrow keys. We're going to swap this out in a minute. And then it's getting a direction. This is basically applying the arrow keys to the uh, current facing vector of the player. So when you press W, you move forward and not uh, forward in world space. If you don't understand what that means, I'll explain in a second. And lastly, it's checking if we're pushing a button and if we are we're going to move in that direction. And we're doing this with the move and slide function. So actually this would already work right now. So if we do just press Ctrl S and we run this project and we select the current scene, which is gonna be the main scene. You can see we're already looking through the camera and if we press the arrow keys, the player is already moving. Of course, there's some things we need to improve. We wanna look with the mouse I want to be able to sprint and crouch and some other stuff. So let's approve upon this script. The first thing I'd like to do here is remove the naming of speed and jump velocity. I don't like these all caps variables. So I'm just going to call this speed, copy it and paste it everywhere where it's used. And the same for jump velocity. right there. Next up, you can see the current speed variable in this controller is a const, which means it's never going to change. But in our case, we want to sprint or we want to crouch. And in those cases, the speed will change. So we're going to change it to a variable. And we're actually going to rename it a little bit again, because it's not going to be the constant speed of the player, but it's only going to be the current speed. Oh, so we'll prefix it with current current underscore speed. Then we'll copy this again and place it everywhere where speed is used. And we're going to give the controller a couple of more speeds to use. So we're going to create a new variable or this one can actually be a const. And we're going to say walking speed. It's going to be equal to 5.0. You can play with the speeds how you like. Next up, we're going to make a sprinting speed. I'm going to get set this one to eight and last we're going to create a crouching speed. And this one will be three in my case. If you're going to be playing with these variables a lot, tweaking them, a nice trick is to add in the front, add export, add symbol plus export, and then set it to a variable. And this way, when you're looking in the 3D scene and you select your player, you have the variable right here in the inspector and you can tweak it. Uh, more easily without editing the code. But for me, I'm just going to keep these constant. So I'm going to change it back to const. So next up, let's set these speeds when we want them to be set. So in the physics process, we're going to check which buttons we are pushing and changing the speed accordingly. So first we'll check for the sprinting button. You can do this by typing if input with a capital I. Oh. Input with a capital I that is action pressed. This means is the button being held down. 
it's going to sprint. And then we're going to set our current speed equal to the sprinting speed. And if not, so else, we're going to set our current speed equal to the walking speed. And with this very basic logic, we can change our speed of our player. So let's run the scene again. And now when we walk around, still with the arrow keys, we press shift. You can see we go a lot faster all of a sudden. And we let go, we're walking again. Now let's change to those uh, keys we set earlier in the beginning, instead of just the arrow keys. This is very easily done by changing UI left to left, UI right to right, UI up to forward, and UI down to backwards. Let's run the scene again. And now we can move with WASD, sprint with shift. All right, looking good so far. Let's get our mouse looking around. For this, we're gonna need a new variable, the mouse sensitivity. I'm gonna create this as a const as well. And you're gonna want a quite low number for this because default uh, sensitivity is quite high. I'm just gonna call it mouse underscore sense. I'm gonna set it equal to 0 0.4. Now, when we run the project, you can see our mouse is free to move outside of the window. We don't want this. We want the mouse to be locked inside of the window and hidden so we can move the camera around without moving our cursor out of the bounds. This is done in the ready function. The ready function in a Godot script is run once at the beginning of execution. So this is perfect for capturing our mouse and making sure it doesn't escape the screen. So type func underscore ready. And in here, we're gonna change the input mode. So again, we're gonna grab our input variable with capital I dot set mouse mode and in here we're going to use one of these suggested uh, variables and we're going to set uh, captured input dot mouse mode captured all capitals and now when you run the scene you will see we can't move our mouse and it's hidden so that's perfect now let's make the player look around uh, I'm quitting, by the way, by using Alt-Tab, because you can no longer use your mouse. So I'm just Alt-Tabbing out and pressing the Stop button right here. So let's look around. For this, we're going to need a couple of things. Uh, we're going to be able to rotate the head. So we're going to need this head. Godot has this awesome feature where you can drag uh, notes from your project into your code, and you'll instantly get a reference. So I'm just going to click Head drag it in, holding down control to create a variable and letting go. And now you can see we have a head variable, which is referencing the head of the player. Now let's rotate this head around when we move our mouse left to right. We're going to do this in the input function. Let's create it. func underscore input. You can see it autocorrected me with an event variable. We're going to need this variable. Now the input function captures every input, so mouse buttons, uh, keyboard inputs, everything. But we're just going to need the mouse inputs here, so let's filter that out. So we're going to say if event is input mouse motion, input event mouse motion, capitalized, then we'll know that it's our mouse moving that we're currently getting in the input function. So now that we know that our input event is a mouse motion, let's rotate our player by the amount uh, the mouse moved. We're going to rotate around on the y-axis uh, by the amount the mouse moves from right to left, which is the x-axis. Sounds a little confusing, I'll explain. So we're going to rotate y, which is the way we're going to rotate the player, but we're going to rotate it by event.relative.x. Event relative x is the amount the mouse moved on the x-axis. And then we're going to multiply this by our mouse sensitivity. And now let's run this, see what it looks like. You can see it is working. We're rotating around by moving our mouse from left to right. But it's rotating a lot. The mouse sensitivity is way too high. 
And this is actually not a problem with the sensitivity. This is because we're rotating in radians, which uh, are a lot smaller than degrees, what we usually use. So we're just going to quickly convert to degrees by saying degrees to radiant. And in here, we're going to put the whole event relative x times mouse sensitivity. And now we run it, should be a lot slower. Yeah, it feels a lot better, only it's inverted. So we'll just quickly add a minus before event relative x to invert it. All right, awesome. We can look around, sprint around. We can even already jump because it was in the default template. Now let's do up and down. And this is why we got the little head and we put our camera in the head. Because if we would just rotate the whole player uh, up and down, the whole physics would glitch out and we would rotate the whole collision shape. It's not a great idea. We're just going to rotate the head. You can actually see this if you select the head and rotate the x-axis. That's what we want. So we're going to do almost exactly the same. But instead, we're just going to type head dot rotate. And we're going to do this on the x-axis like I just showed. And we can just copy this whole line <coughs> and just change out x to y. And we'll see if this is inverted or not. Let's check it out. No, that's perfect. So now we can look up and down and around. Mouse sensitivity is a little high for me, so I'm going to turn it down a little bit, maybe 2.5. Yeah, that's better. So now we can look around, jump around, and already sprint around. But the first problem you'll notice with this is that we can look all the way down and keep going. And we can invert our head. This is not what we want. We can also do it upwards. So we're going to use a function called clamp for this, which does exactly as it says on the tin. It clamps a certain value. So we're going to set our head dot rotation. Oop. Dot x equal to clamp head dot rotation dot x. So the clamp function takes three variables. First, the variable it's going to clamp, and then it's minimum and it's maximum. Our minimum is going to be minus 98 degrees, and our maximum is going to be 98 degrees. And like I said, they're degrees and not radians, so we're going to have to convert them again using the degrees to radians function. So we just copy this, put it in front of the minus 98 and in front of the positive 98. And now we'll run it again. You can see we can no longer look all the way up or all the way down. So this is already a very basic uh, first person controller. There are a couple of things I want to optimize with this. The first one being uh, inputs are very snappy, meaning if I go press left, I'm instantly going left. And if I press forward, I'm instantly going forward. To add a little bit of a better feel to a first person controller, you want these things to be gradular. When you press left, you want a little bit of speeding up and a little bit of slowing down when you stop pushing any inputs. This is a personal preference. And if your uh, game is more like this, then you can of course keep it like this. But I'm going to add some snappiness to it. And I'm going to declare this in a variable. I'm going to name this variable lerp speed. I'm going to set it to 10. It's just what we used before. I'll explain later. But uh, we're calling it lerp speed because what we're going to use is a lerp function, which does what I explained earlier. It, it gradually changes a value instead of just instantly being 1 or 0. So that's the function we're going to use to change the speed of the player and some other things. And that's why I'm calling it lerp. And we're going to use this variable to lerp between uh, our input and our actual direction. And for this, we're going to need to make direction global because the input there is just uh, the literal button presses into a vector. And then the direction is this translated into uh, the world space. And in order to lerp this uh, direction, we're going to need to reference itself, which we can do right now because it's being declared right here. So we're just going to take out far and direction, control C, move all the way to the top, control V, and set it equal to an empty vector tree right now. So vector tree dot zero, now it's an empty vector tree. And here we don't need the far anymore because it's already declared. 
and now we can lerp this. So we'll type lerp direction, the variable we just created, and we're going to set it to the input multiplied by the world space or the forward vector of the player. And then the speed that we want to lerp this at is going to be delta, which is a time indication. You can see right here. This is so the logic of the lerp is not tied to the frame rate, but rather tied to actual time. And then we're going to multiply this by the lerp speed. And when we run this again, you can see the player takes a little while to slow down and start up. Anyway, it's personal preference, but I like to feel it is more than just a super snappy instant controller. But tweak the lerp setting as you please, or just remove it entirely if it's not your thing. Now, the last thing we're going to add in this first tutorial is crouching. We already set an input button for crouching, so let's first change the speed accordingly uh, to pressing the crouch button. Now, crouching is dominant. And what I mean by that is if you're pressing sprint and you're pressing crouch, you're crouching, you're not sprinting. So we can wrap this whole uh, sprinting logic in another if statement saying if input dot is action pressed crouch we're going to set our current speed equal to crouching speed and if we're not pressing crouch then we might be able to uh, sprint or if we're not sprinting walk let's run this right now so this is walking speed, when you press control, we slow down to crouching speed, we let go of control, we're walking again. And if we're sprinting and we're pressing down control, we're crouching, we're not sprinting. Now, of course, for crouching, you're gonna need to move your player down. For this, we're gonna create a variable called crouching depth. I'm gonna set it equal to minus 0 0.5. This is how much lower the camera will be when we're crouching relative to walking. And then we're going to set the camera uh, to this height. And with the camera, we're just going to use the head for now. So if we're pressing crouch, we'll set head dot position dot y equal to crouching depth. And if we're not crouching, then head dot position dot y will be equal to zero, its starting location. Let's run this now. Oh, sorry, that's my mistake. The starting location is of course not zero. It is, when we go into the head, set it to 1.8. So set it to 1.8, and we'll set our height when crouching equal to 1.8, the player height, uh, plus the crouching depth, because this is already minus, so we need to add it here. Let's test this out. Right now you can see when you crouch, you go down. It's very jumpy. And I think you can already guess what we're gonna do to make this better. We're gonna lerp it again. So again, we're gonna wrap this in a lerp function. So type lerp, open it up. And the first variable is the variable we're gonna want to lerp. So head to position dot y. Then we're going where we're gonna lerp it to, which is right there. And then again, we're gonna do it by delta times our lerp speed. We'll copy this whole line and paste it in right here and just remove this crouching depth. Let's run it again. And now you can see crouching looks a lot better. So we can crouch, we can sprint. Only problem right now is when we go into our 3D scene and we take our floor, hit Ctrl D to duplicate it, move it up so we can have an example of an obstacle we'll have to crouch under. I moved a little bit to the left as well. Now we'll run the scene again. You can see we can crouch, but we cannot move under it because we're not changing our collision shape. We're still this tall guy, our head is just lower. So let's fix this right now. For this, we're going to add a second collision shape. So I'm actually going to rename the current collision shape by double clicking it and saying, naming it
standing collision shape. And then I'm going to click it, press Ctrl D and call this one. Crouching collision shape. And this one is of course going to be smaller. So I'll go into the capsule and right click it and make unique. This is very important. Otherwise we're going to be editing both of the capsules. Make unique. And the height is not going to be 2 meters, but I'm actually going to create maybe it's 1.2 maybe. And then drag it down so it's on the origin. Might be a little small, we might have to adjust it, but for now, let's use this. I also see the naming is not right. Alright, let's save this. Go into our script. And we're going to need these two collision shapes to enable them accordingly. I'm going to do this the same way we added in the head. We're just dragging and dropping, holding down control. Also for the crouching shape, drag and drop, holding down control. And then we're going to take these two variables and enable and disable them accordingly. First I'm going to disable the crouching shape uh, in the editor so we don't crouch when we spawn. And then right here, this is our crouching logic. In here the standing collision shape. We're going to disable it by saying standing collision shape dot disable equals true. Oh, there's a little slash here. I'm going to copy this line and into the standing logic, I'm going to flip it so it's false. Then I'm going to copy this line again, grab our crouching shape. Where is it? Right there and set this one to false. And then right here, copy it and set this one to true. So now we're using our crouching collision shape when we're crouching and our standing collision shape when we're standing. Let's rerun the project. And now when we crouch, we can go under this block. Sprint around, run around and crouch under this block. Now you're going to encounter one problem, and that is when you're crouching and you go under something and then let go of crouch, you're able to glitch into the block above. This is because there's no detection for checking if there's something above your head before you stand up. So that's the last thing we'll add in this tutorial. I'm going to go back into 3D scene. We're going to add something to detect if there's something above us before we can stand up. For this, we're going to go into the player node, click add child node and search for a raycast 3D. Let me quickly drag it off to the side so I can explain what this is. So a raycast 3D is basically an, a beam, an arrow, which checks for collisions within this arrow, which is perfect for our example because we can just point it up by two meters. You can actually do this in target position, type two instead of minus one in the Y. And now we're checking the whole player height if there's anything in the way and if there is we're not going to stand up and if there's not we're going to be able to stand up. So I'm going to drag this back into our player. Just transform 0000. zero, zero, zero. And now when we go back into scripts we're going to need this node. So again drag and drop it into your code holding down control. Trap the raycast variable. And in here, we're going to make sure that this raycast is not colliding before we stand up. So we're going to change this else to else if, which is written elif. And in here, we're going to check raycast3d.is colliding. And we're going to add a little exclamation mark in front to check if it's not colliding. Let's run this code again. And now when we crouch and we go under this block, we let go. We cannot stand up. But when we move out of the block, you can see we can stand up again. All right, perfect. That's everything for this tutorial. The last thing I'm going to do is clean up the code a little bit because it's going to be quite a large file by the end of these tutorials. So code organization is important. First, let's manage all these variables. I'm going to add some labels here. You can add comments in GD scripts by using a little hashtag. 
I'm going to call this player nodes. This doesn't actually do anything in the code, it's just for readability. And then here I'm going to copy this comment and I'm going to call this speedverse. I'm actually going to move this mouse sensitivity down with direction. So these two can be input variables. Then I'm going to move this crouching depth with uh, the speeds and the jump velocity. And I'm going to call these movement verse. Actually, the lerp can also be right there. Then you can see the uh, template code already has some comments, so that's nice. We're just going to have to comment our own little piece of code, which is just this. It's not a lot of code. And this is going to be what we're doing here is handling handle movement state, movement state, not movement state. And here we can add a little tag. Crouching, if we ever need to add anything to crouching. So this will be crouching. Uh, right here we'll have a piece of code that is Standing, so our standing logic, if we're going to add anything, we'll go here. And right here we'll have our sprinting. And right here we'll have our walking. Right now it looks really weird to just comment out these single line of lines of code. But later it will make like, sense and it will be very handy, I promise you. Let's also add some enters to keep some things separate. I like the collision shaping, head position, yeah, that's all readable. All right, perfect. Oh, we can come with this out. Perfect, so that's our first tutorial done. And the next one will handle head bobbing uh, and free looking. Hope you enjoyed this one, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.